um, you know, essentially the first edition, if you will. And um, but the uh, the later reports, they've kind of uh, tried to distance themselves um, uh, as a corporation. Can you share with us what the essence of the findings were? Um, well, I guess the biggest concerns were they were acknowledging this is March 21st, 10 days after the accident. They were acknowledging massive fuel failures on Units 1, 2, and 3. Now, I was saying that on our blog because I had studied Three Mile Island and I knew that when you don't put water into a nuclear reactor for 12 hours, you're going to have massive fuel failures. But the condition, the, the, the Japanese government and uh, uh, Tokyo Electric were telling everyone, well, they thought maybe 5% fuel damage. Um, and as a matter of fact, the, um, the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, was saying 5% fuel damage. So I was out there on our blog saying 70%, and here's I, IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, saying 5%. Now, since then, they've come to my 70, but um, initially they were trying to downplay the significance of the event along with all the other players. I think what the Arriva report shows, though, is that the other players weren't dumb. They knew there was the damage I was talking about. They just didn't want to talk about it themselves. And what do you think about that relative to the Japanese people and what kind of effects there are going to be there? What is your take now on the situation? And if you were living in any other areas of Japan, would you be looking at migrating away? There, uh, there's two questions there. What, what do I think about the report and how the officials handled it. Yes. I think they should have evacuated out to 30 or 40 kilometers, which is about 25 miles immediately. And I think they knew it, um, especially for pregnant women and children where the fetus is growing really fast and things like that. Um, and um, because they, they just didn't want people to go become sour on nuclear power and they had a lot of money invested in this facility... They waited and hemmed and hawed and, and basically hoped things were better than all the data suggested. So um, the, the authorities had all the information they needed within three days to order an evacuation out to 25 miles and should have. And even now they're not there. They're saying, well, take your time. In the next month you can pull out, but um, th there's no real rush. And, in fact, um, I, I think you're going to see... Uh, greater incidences, incidences of cancer as, as a result. Now, about where you live, uh, I get these questions on the, on the, on, in our emails, and it's tough. Um, I guess I would say um, that, there's a, that the, if you haven't, if you're not within that emergency zone, which I would put out to say 40 kilometers or, or about 25 miles, um, you're probably okay unless, and, and here's the two big unlesses. Um, my big concern is that the, um, there'll be a, a, another earthquake, not as big as the nine that started, but, but an aftershock. And some of these aftershocks can be huge. Correct. And the plants are already severely damaged. So my concern is that now you've got these plants that are already damaged that will get another aftershock and, um, and fail. So we'll have more containment failures and, and other releases of radiation. So if you don't get an earthquake, um, they'll probably hold together, and um, probably over the next year or so they'll get them under control. In the meantime, they'll be releasing radiation uh, all the time. Uh, they'll be venting radiation, and the containments are leaking, and there'll be leaks into the ocean. Um, but the big releases are probably behind us on the three plants that, um, that had meltdowns. So concern number one is, a, is an earthquake. Concern number two is, um, is that Unit 4 fuel pool. If it goes dry, and we wind up with that Brookhaven scenario that I was telling you about where, where you can volatilize plutonium and, um, and you know, put hundreds of thousands of people at risk. So... Uh, now TEPCO's got one of these, that, one of those gigantic trucks that they bought are, are over there pouring water into that contain, into that fuel pool all the time. The problem is it's leaking. Uh, it's leaking at the bottom. There, there's a, some sort of a crack in it. Um, that was actually in the Arriva report. Arriva knew the pool was cracked from the earthquake, 
not from any explosions, but from the earthquake. So the pool, if left alone, will run dry and could, could cause a fuel pool fire, which would um, make the plutonium go airborne and could cause an enormous number of cancers. So those are my two big concerns for the future. If neither of those happen, staying where you are is just fine. Um, and, um, and if either of them do, I don't know how far away you'd have to run. Ariva also was quoted as saying, we're witnessing one of the greatest accidents in modern times. Yes, that was an amazing quote. Um, they, they said it was, we're witnessing one of the greatest industrial accidents in modern time. Um, I think they said the greatest. Um, yes. Probably the other one could be Bhopal, and I don't think we should downplay Bhopal. That was the chemical plant by Union Carbide in, right. um, that killed tens of thousands of people from gases that were released. So I think this is right up there with, with Bhopal. From a cost standpoint, this is the biggest. Um, we're looking at probably, well, the plants were worth on the order of oh, 10 or $20 billion, and now they're worth less. And then on top of that, it'll cost 30 or $40 billion to uh, dismantle the plants. So there's a, uh, $50, $60 billion right there, and that doesn't include cleaning up the local communities um, so that um, um, this can easily go into hundreds of billions of dollars of cleanup. Who insures the nuclear companies? Who insures TEPCO? Is there an insurance carrier for these type of plants? No, there's not. Uh, TEPCO probably could self-insure to the tune of maybe $10 billion. In other words, they could you know, dip into all their assets and refinance or whatever and come up with $10 billion. But we're already talking $100 billion. And the, um, you cannot get insurance on a nuclear plant. Um, the, the, the insurance industry doesn't refuse us to write insurance on a nuclear plant. So here in the States, we have this thing called Price-Anderson, which is a, it's a sort of an insurance policy. But basically what it means is that after about $10 billion, that the, all of the nuclear plants pool their money. So that 100 plants pool about um, 100 million each, and uh, the first 10 billion is paid for by the industry. Anything after that, you and I pay for. It comes out of taxes. Of course, and that's why they don't have to make sure that every aspect of the plants are safe. That's why they can get away with what they get away with because there's nothing holding them accountable. Nothing really. You're right. Without that insurance policy, this industry would shut down. And if you look at the uh, Gulf oil spill, I mean, here's, here's British Petroleum. Um, th- those costs were over $20 billion, and British Pet- Petroleum paid for it out of their own coffers. In the nuclear industry, it's not like that. In the nuclear industry, if there's an accident, taxpayers pay. If taxpayers pay, then we should be actually the ones who have the final say about what's safe, not them. I couldn't agree more with you. If taxpayers pay, we should control who's on the commission and, and how the commission, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, does its business. But in fact, it's been captured. Uh, there's, a, there's a term, actually, called regulatory capture. Um, and um, initially, they start out with great intent, and then over time, the industry that they were supposed to be regulating captures them. And uh, the NRC has been captured by the nuclear regulator, by, by the people it's supposed to be regulating. You originally got into the nuclear industry, obviously with good intentions, and you had to have something that led you into the industry. You were a licensed reactor operator. What attracted you to doing that? Um, the math is beautiful. The, the, and I was really good at math. <laughs> and and it, it, if you play the numbers, it works great. But you have to realize that people are running these plants. And, and you know, if you take the people out of the equation, the, the math is truly beautiful, how, the, how these atoms split and all that kind of stuff. But I, I, I have developed in a, a saying that I didn't have when I started. Um, say, it says, uh, sooner or later, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. I like that. Well, thank you. That's, and that's the problem. It's, it's uh, you know, you can make the numbers work, but as soon as you put people in the equation, um, people are fallible, and people make assumptions, you know, like Fukushima. 
Um, they assumed uh, uh, about a 25